Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Claire, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am pleased to introduce this virtual event with Dr. Ann Wolbert Burgess presenting A Killer by Design, Murderers, Mind Hunters, and My Quest to Decipher the Criminal Mind. She'll be joined in conversation by her co-author, Stephen Constantine. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and to our growing digital community during these challenging times. Thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Uh, our 2022 events calendar is in full swing and it appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and even browse our shelves from home. After the introduction, I'll drop a link in the chat to order a copy of the book. Your purchases and financial contributions, I will also share a link to donate, uh, make this virtual author series possible, and now more than ever, support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. Um, if you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, just go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Uh, this event also has closed captioning available. Uh, depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. And finally, <laughs> as you might have experienced uh, over virtual gatherings, I don't know, past two years, um, technical issues might arise. If they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Uh, Dr. Ann Wolbert Burgess is a leading forensic and psychiatric nurse who has worked with the FBI for over two decades. She is a professor at BC's Kennel, Kennel School of Nursing. And for Netflix fans, uh, she is the basis for Wendy Carr on Mindhunter. Tonight, she'll be talking with Stephen Constantine, her co-author. Stephen is Assistant Director of Marketing and Communications at the Canal School of Nursing. Uh, from innumerable true crime podcasts to the 23 and counting seasons of Law and Order SVU, our society is fascinated by serial killers and sexual predators. But for a long time, law enforcement had no idea where to start when it came to identifying suspects based on behavioral science. Dr. Burgess changed all that. Her pioneering work on sexual assault and trauma helped the FBI identify, interview, and track down dozens of notoriously violent offenders. A Killer by Design recounts her astounding career and offers insights into both the headline grabbing criminals as well as the victims she's worked ceaselessly to protect. And in absolute rave in psychology today, Gary Bracado begins his review by noting the book is a page turner that he devoured in a single day. Uh, before going on to say, Burgess's book excels in a number of ways, filling in details in the history of how the FBI came to study and understand serial killing and sexual violence, revealing her private thoughts about her own profound contributions, and adding wonderful depth to our understanding of other forensic icons. And in the Star Review, Publishers Weekly says it's an affecting memoir and names it one of their PW picks. Uh, and so now I am very pleased uh, to turn things over to tonight's speakers. The digital podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Um, so Dr. Burgess, one of the great things about collaborating on this book with you uh, was how easy it was. Your office is right above mine here at Boston College. Um, so at least in the early days prior to the pandemic, uh, you would come down or I would go up to your office and we would just chat about your story, your history, uh, the cases that this book touches upon, all sorts of behind the scenes anecdotes from your days in the FBI. Uh, and it was a lot of fun for me to have that experience just learning directly from you. Um, so this evening, I think we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna uh, just chat casually. Um, and if anyone has any questions in the audience and they wanna just put their questions into the Q&A, we'll happily take those as they come up. Uh, but so the first question that I have for you is a lot of the agents that you worked with in the BSU, uh, Douglas and Ressler particularly, wrote books about their experiences um, fairly early on. And Douglas's was turned into the Netflix show Mindhunter. Uh, so the question is, why did you wait until now to do it? Why did you think that this was the right time to tell your story? 
Well, I'd say there are a couple of reasons why I waited till now. Uh, the main one is what you just said is I, you came to Canal School of Nursing and I had an opportunity to meet you and it was really exciting to talk over cases that I hadn't talked over before and to, as a new case would come up on in the media or something, we'd often talk about how we could profile it and so forth. But then also the, um, uh, the Netflix Mindhunter series was very influential when I found out that they had named a character after uh, my work with the uh, agents of um, Wrestler and Douglas, and that was that Dr. Wendy Carr. So I had to see it. I was really curious how they were portraying me on that, and that was uh, important. And about that time, we decided to see if we could invite John Douglas to Boston College and do a Mindhunter, revisiting of Mindhunter, if you will. And that really pulled together a lot of the, in, in prepping for that, to pull together a lot of um, materials that I realized I still had, and also realized that we had never done the second part of the project, which was on the profiling. So uh, that, uh, I think we started talking about that, and it, it became more and more of a reality. You were thinking more in terms of my uh, career and how this fit in or didn't fit in, so to speak. And so we started writing and um, it was, it, it was, I, I think we just got caught up in it. We were able to get a literary agent, Alice Martell from Martell agency. And that was a big, big help. She was very supportive. And then uh, we get the um, Carrie Napolitano with the Hachette publishing group, which was uh, wonderful. So I think that's what pulled together a whole lot of materials. I think when you saw the materials, that was important that you realized that we had something that we could really authentically write on. We didn't have to just think about our, our memories of, of something that happened back in the 80s and 90s. And so that was critical, I think, to, uh, to help you pull, pull some material together. We had actually, transcribed, uh, recorded and transcribed the profiling sessions that the agents would do. And it was remarkable to see how they could take a case where there was no known suspect and they would put the uh, crime scenes on the table. They'd all sit around and they'd talk about, well, could it be this? Could it be that? And uh, that was how they would then get the profile characteristics back to the local police department. And they would start re-interviewing people and solving cases. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was one of the great things also about working with you was that you do have this fantastic archive of materials from your days with the with the FBI and the BSU, um, you know, transcripts of these profiling sessions, like you said, uh, right. a lot of photos of crime scenes, uh, and just of your colleagues from that time period. Um, video recordings uh, of interviews with serial killers. So there was so much to draw from. Uh, we didn't have to sensationalize anything or, or try and make anything up because all the content was there and it really spoke for itself. And your story, you know, is a very compelling sort of different angle of looking at this body of work. Uh, a, a lot of, like I said, a lot of the agents wrote their books um, you know, serial killers are sensationalized a lot in pop culture and TV. But your story is really interesting because it starts off very differently. It starts off with your work as a nurse. And that's what caught the attention of the FBI. Uh, so can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, my, my work as a nurse uh, really helped also in the really first research project I did at Boston College. And that was with Linda Lyle Holmstrom on looking at the problems that women had after uh, or, or men had as a result of being raped. She knew that this was gonna be a very important issue for women. And so we were able to gain access to the, one of the largest hospitals in the Boston area where they did bring rape victims. And over a one year period saw 146 people between the ages of three and 73. And that was really the impetus for our writing on rape victims. So the victim piece, was really, really important. And the other important piece at that particular time was that the uh, women's movement was putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on uh, uh, Congress and so forth to do something about the problem 
of, uh, of rape. They weren't getting rapists caught. They weren't getting them put in prison. There was not much going on. So that task fell to William Webster, who was head of the FBI. And indeed, he said, well, we'll have to get our, our training division, the FBI Academy out of Quantico to look at that. And that's where they assigned the new course in rape victimology or rape investigation to Roy Hazelwood. And Roy Hazelwood, who was more of an expert in hostage negotiations, realized he better get up to speed on that, talked to one of the police officers out in Los Angeles who happened to also be a nurse. This is where nursing really is important and, and the connections with nursing. And she said she had read the article in her in the journal, American Journal of Nursing, and told Roy to get see if he could get hold of me. Said there's a nurse on the East Coast. Why don't you see if she'll come down and and talk to your agents? And that's really how I got invited down to talk on rape victims. And in the process, they were also putting pressure on all of the instructors at the behavioral science unit that they needed to do their own research. And I got introduced to Bob Ressler and to um, John Douglas and was fascinated. They were already doing kind of a, a little, uh, rather, if you will, not by the books type of research. They were going into prisons and interviewing criminals and uh, in talking with them realized they had a lot of very, very important information that could be used, but they didn't have it organized. They didn't have it what we call put into a methodological bundle. And so that's where the decision was made to join with them and see if we could get the project out. And that was the project on sexual homicide. Right. Um, and that was something else I found really interesting too about your story and about the FBI was the agents uh, in the BSU and at the FBI Academy, part of their job was to go out and teach on the road to local area law enforcement officers uh, to explain unusual crimes, uh, new investigative techniques, um, and just to take their expertise and share it uh, as wide and far as possible. Um, but when they were assigned the task of understanding this new surge in uh, sexual assault and rape crimes, they just had no expertise whatsoever. It was a taboo subject. Uh, very few people were talking about it. Um, you yourself got a lot of uh, pushback when you wanted to first do your original study that caught the attention of the FBI. Uh, so it, it, was, it was not uh, an easy process. Um, but then, you know, Hazelwood heard of your story, uh, understood how important it was, understood the value of you teaching that to uh, agents and to, uh, to the BSU itself. Um, and so he brought you in. And we have a, a short excerpt from the book that talks about your, your transition from, from nursing to the BSU, if you don't mind reading that, please. Yes, I'll, I'll take that. See, um, it's really uh, the origins of a nurse uh, excerpt. Um, I cut my teeth learning on the violent side of human nature as a doctoral student studying psychiatric nursing at the start of the 1970s. I was fascinated by the human mind and how it worked and how its instabilities could lead to the most extreme form of behavior. But as was typical in the 1970s, an era, an era when overt sexism was woven into the culture at large, my interest in understanding what motivated these abnormal behaviors was often dismissed as a, uh, is either a phase or a novelty, or worst of all, cute by men in charge. In those days, women were pers who pursued a career in nursing were expected to conform to the handmaiden stereotype. We were like doll-like figures in stark white dresses, tall stockings, and pristine starch caps. Our value was measured in how well we could carry out physicians' orders, not by what we could contribute ourselves. But that wasn't going to work for me. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make it on my own terms, regardless of the archaic expectations that had large, long been imposed on my gender. Of course, I wasn't the type to make things easy on myself, in addition to the cultural hurdles I faced, I also had to contend with the reality that psychiatric nursing 
was a largely unknown concept at that time. In fact, the specialty itself had only been required part of professional nursing education until 1955. A response to the end of World War II and the growing need for qualified professionals to care for returning service members with psychiatric needs. Couple that with the fact that nursing had only reached the terminal degree of level a few years before made it all the more important that, um, that I, I, I had made an important impression on me. So it all added up to me being one of a very small number of known experts in a lesser known field. I was really in uncharted territory. But my opportunity to ab analyze the abnormal minds came via graduate work at Spring Grove State Hospital in Maryland. It was a large institution, but its psychiatric units were overcrowded and underfunded. So I was given the freedom to work with, quote, whichever patient you help the most, end quote. I was drawn to female patients suffering from mental illness. Almost immediately, I realized that the vast majority of these women hadn't been born with mental illness or developed it at a young age. The common thread was being victims of a sexual assault. These women had been attacked, stigmatized, and forced to manage the trauma of their experience on their own, silently, or face the likely consequences of being blamed for instigating their own vicious attack. It was an impossible burden. It took a continuous toll. And once they could no longer bear it, they ended up here at the hospital. So that's how the book sort of starts. Um, it, it toggles back and forth between this urgent case uh, you're with the BSU uh, at this time. You're six floors underground in Quantico working on this urgent case that's out of Nebraska where two young boys have been killed. Uh, it's established that it's a serial killer on the loose. Uh, you kind of have this flashback moment where you're thinking back to your nursing work uh, and to what got you a seat at that table. Um, and then you dive right on into that first profiling case. And the book kind of sets that pattern and continues that going forward where it looks at an element of the profiling process. And then it uses a case to show how that would actually play out in real life. Um, so I'm going to skip forward just a little bit. So one of the first cases that uh, the book discusses is the Jean Jobert case, which is that one out of Nebraska. Uh, and can you speak a little bit about why this case was important to begin with and the influence that this case had on the profiling process? Sure. This was a really important case because the community was frantic. It was just horrible that this young 12-year-old boy who was just out delivering newspapers on a Sunday morning ended up in a ditch, dead in a ditch on the side of a, of a road. And that's all that the, the local police tried to figure out who could possibly have done it. And they were really un, unable to. So they called in the um, behavioral science unit. Bob Ressler happened to be the agent that uh, received the case. And he immediately went out to see the uh, crime scene that, that was really important at that time, got the pictures, talked to the investigators, and uh, wrote up a profile. He, he profiled it because they, they weren't, they didn't know who possibly could have done this. And so they, they had the profile. And then of course, what happened is three months later, there was a second uh, young boy murdered. Uh, this time the body was in the woods. It wouldn't have been found except for two hunters that happened to be in the woods hunting. And there was snow and the body was almost covered over with snow. If they hadn't found it then, this was like end of November, he probably never would have been found until the snows um, uh, disappeared. And so Bob was called out again. He uh, went out, talked to people. By this time, they now had a uh, team together. They had both local police, state police, and now they had called in the FBI. And he looked at everything and he updated his profile uh, it was important that the uh, body had been found in the woods with one, two sets of footprints going in and only one coming out. So that was very different than the first uh, victim who had just been, if you will, left at the side of the road. 
So he came up with the profile, uh, felt it would be, by this time, he felt it would be a young, a male, a young male in his, he said late 20s or uh, late teens, early 20s. And because it was near a, he thought he, because it was the same time each time that they, they think that the uh, murder had occurred, he felt that he worked, that the killer worked and maybe was, uh, or was getting ready to go to work. This was an important time, early morning. And he came up with a profile that even said it, felt it would be an uh, E4 at Offutt Air Base, which was right there in Nebraska, where they were, where they were looking. And they publicized that widely. That was the important thing. I think that they use so much of the media to, to, to tell, warn people, and here's, here's what you should be looking for. And I was uh, around Christmas time, kids were at home and people were getting really, really very nervous that there might be a third case. But this one teacher who had been listening and so forth noticed this very suspicious car and that the person in, driving the car had made rather hostile verbal statements. So she took down the car, uh, license plate number and called it in to the local police and they investigated and they found that it was did indeed was a rented car, but the car that was rented out of, they were able to locate and it, sure enough, it did match to a uh, soldier at, at Offutt Air Force Base. And they went out, they interviewed him and it turned out to be um, John Jobert. And if you look at the picture of him, how young he looks, even though he was, I think by that, that time he was early 20s, but he almost looks like a kid himself. And here he is going after kids very young, well, young, almost teenagers. And they were able to do quite a uh, interview with him, with the tapes, that was a, an important case because it uh, solved the case. And it took the, uh, received a uh, congressional record. The uh, FBI published their appreciation of the case in the federal record. And that was the first time that such attention and such accommodation had been given to the profiling group down at Quantico. And then the, of course, the task force received credit too. It was a very, in, in certain respects, a very important case, very rewarding case. It was a very tragic case. Uh, they later found out when Bob would present the case when they had other agents and law enforcement coming in, a uh, detective from Maine happened to come up to him after class one day and said that this case sounds so much like a case that we have unsolved up in Maine. And so Bob said, well, send us the uh, material. He looked at it and says, this is the same. Uh, yes, I think this is the same case, the uh, same Jean Joubert. And they went out, interviewed him, and sure enough, it was. He had killed a young uh, Ricky Stetson in Maine, um, and then he had joined the service. So he had gotten away from the area and went and, and entered the Air Force out in, not in Nebraska, but later was sent there. And they even found some earlier, not, not murders, but they found some earlier uh, minor criminal activity that was really what you would call his kind of preparation, trying out which they often do, these serial killers often do. So it was an important case. Absolutely. I thought one of the things that was really interesting about this case too, and why it was important to include it early on, was that by uh, being written up in the record of Congress, it sort of elevated the stature of the profiling process and created a lot of awareness so that local law enforcement then realized they had this tool of profiling at the FBI and law enforcement could send in their most challenging cases and get some help. Yeah. Uh, you know, profiling was never intended to be its own standalone process. It was a technique that local law could use. And they started to do so um, pretty soon after the Jobert case to the point that uh, I think it was John Douglas had to say, all right, we have to put some rules in place. We're getting too many cases. We have to limit what's allowed to come in. So it was a real big success for the team uh, and for the FBI as a whole. Um, there's a few questions that came in the Q&A, so I just want to get to a couple of those real quick, and then we'll dive back into the presentation. Um, the first one says, hi, Dr. Burgess. I'm a friend of Alex's and a clinical psych grad student at BU. I've read that the precursor of psychopathy, antisocial personality disorder can be identified in children as callous on emotional, but must go 
one, to not com commit crimes, live normal lives without hurting others. What are some of the major factors that led to people with strong, dark traits or ASBD going on to commit heinous crimes? Well, I can certainly speak to what was in uh, Jean Jobert. They were able to trace back and there was documentation of his um, his, his early fantasy life. Uh, I think he was only five or six years old when he said that he wanted to cannibalize. I don't think he used that word, but really cannibalize his babysitter, that he had such uh, thoughts at such an early age of such a, a destructive kind of, of, of view of people that he was already thinking about it. And that got carried through to, um, Obviously, because he started by the time he was, even before he was a teenager, he was doing things that would hurt. Well, he would take a pencil and stab it in a girl's back, or he would, uh, uh, things that you would, that they certainly weren't criminal at the time, but they certainly hurt people. And I think your question speaks to that. Uh, these are people that, at least John Chaubert is a type where he doesn't feel emotion. He doesn't feel other people's uh, you know, pain and so forth. So is he antisocial? Well, sure, he's antisocial. Uh, he is bright, though. He's able to get along enough. He's able to, he, he, um, he liked to be in uh, scouting. Scouting was important. And he liked to be on a bicycle. So that whole movement and, and so forth, that kind of became his world. He even went to a, um, he went to college for one year, but the I would, I would assume that the th thinking got too much and he, his grades went way down. And so he had to, he had to leave. Now that could have been also when he, he um, committed his first murder with the, the little Stetson boy, because he then goes out to uh, Nebraska. So hurting people, is he psychopathic? He, well, he certainly doesn't have much empathy for other people. So I would agree with you there that he had a early, traumatic issues, it did have uh, uh, documentation that his mother provided that uh, the, his parents separated and divorced because the father was very abusive and would get rather violent. And she said there was one incident where John was present. He never remembered it, but the father had beaten up the mother. And uh, that, that certainly we now know is uh, pretty traumatic for kids yet he doesn't remember it. I think that's the important thing is a lot of these things can happen and not stay in one's conscious memory. And uh, all the more reason that you have to get uh, interviews with people that have either taken care of him or known him growing up or the person growing up to get at some of that. And just asking him, did your parents ever fight? He probably would have said no, but they didn't get along. He probably would have said, but not that they, uh, violence would be so great. So that's important. And I think the other thing is he, um, he carried these fantasies through his uh, developmental period and, and up certainly up until age 20. Yeah. Um, I think the quote was something like Jean Jobert when he was very little said he wanted to gobble up his babysitter until she was all gone. Hmm. Okay. Uh, which is, you know, you can really visualize it and, you know, a little kid normally might not think those types of thoughts. Um, another question that came in says, do you find that serial killers are born or made or both? I don't think they're born. Um, I know that some people feel that and they've done a lot of research to try to see if there's any genetic loading or anything like that. But I do think that the environment that they're grown into and the situations that they're exposed to have a very important role to play. Um, the other thing is that they, and maybe some of the things that they try to do, the, the evil things, I guess you could call them, but aren't really criminal, uh, are, are not dealt with the way they should be, that people ignore them or they're, they're not, not um, socialized into how what they do can hurt people. So I would, I move more to the side that they, uh, it develops rather than they're born with it. 
Although, it, because even when you say, well, do some of these people have terrible backgrounds, the parents are criminals or they're druggies or whatever. And yes, I'm sure that's true, but don't forget their behavior has an effect on the children. So it isn't necessarily the genetically anything is being transmitted, but certainly the environment that they're brought up in and their development is uh, seriously uh, influenced by, by their caregivers. One of the things that was, uh, you know, also great about working with you was how deep uh, your, the psychological view you took towards these uh, serial killers was. And so I do want to play a quick clip we have that's a satellite interview with Kemper, who's one of the more notorious serial killers, a lot of people know about him, uh, where he agreed to be interviewed by Robert Ressler, uh, four other agents at the FBI Academy. And this is just kind of a a look into his way of thinking about his crimes and his personality and his behaviors. So I'm going to cue that one up real quick. So I'm trying to remember this from a long time ago, but another round had entered and exited that padding area. So there were three holes in that padding area that was head level with her, it was off to her right to my left. She was moving about in the back quadrant there trying to avoid the shots. That wouldn't have happened. I, I realized if I'd never done it, it wouldn't have happened. But if, well, my original intention was to make it very quick and neither one of them to be aware of what was happening. And it was not to keep them from stopping the crime. It was to keep them from suffering. I had a real bad problem depriving people of their lives it wasn't uh, the aspect of killing them, that was the aspect of possessing their bodies afterwards. So it was almost a, after an effect, evicting someone from their human body. And I'm sorry it sounds so cold, but that's about what it analogizes to. So a big part of your work, Dr. Burgess, was um, you know listening to these transcripts, interviewing killers, and taking data, analyzing that, uh, and turning it into something that the FBI could use, parsing information from it. So when you listen to something like that, what what do you hear? Well, what I hear uh, it almost goes back to one of the questions we were asked: is that how he thinks about people? and how, what he does and what he wants to do. So you've got the, the whole, uh, as he says, I, it wasn't the aspect of killing them. So you're not worried about killing them. He's going to kill them. But it's what he really wants to do with them afterwards. So he was the type that would kill first and then do the things that he was going to do to their bodies. Other of the serial killers would like rape first and then kill. So he, right in this um, quote from him and in, in, in his speaking, which he's very articulate and he goes into anything you want to ask him, he's, he's prepared to, to answer for you, but he really wanted to, um, he would kill them and then he dismembered them. I think that's the other important thing is he wouldn't even want to, them to be seen as it wasn't a matter of just killing them. It was a matter of uh, d making them into nothing. It's almost a little bit like what uh, Joe Barry says. He wants to make them all gone. And he essentially does. It, nobody can even identify them. He cuts their hands off and their heads off. So you don't have anything identifying them. Yeah. Um, let me pull up another question from the Q&A because some more are coming in. Um... There's one that asks, uh, could you talk about your work in the context of American society, whether there are cultural elements that play a role in the pervasive violence against women uh, more generally in the U.S.? Well, I think you have to look at the period of time that we were doing this. And I do think that culture does affect um, the crime. It happens in a country. This is back in the, the cases that we're talking about. You, you go back into the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, which is very different than, say, if you want to look at crime now. Uh, we did not have by much diversity in terms of victims. Uh, we certainly didn't have much diversity in terms of offenders. But we, we could say that these were American killings and these were American, all American um, criminals, if you will. And yet we had 
what I've already said, you've had both the extreme. Extreme would be where they mutilate and uh, torture the body after, well, torture would be during, before death, but mutilation would usually be after death. So you have that and you certainly have it now, you have this in other cultures. Uh, I do know that even though we didn't have it in the study that we had, it certainly was available in other cultures. So, um, and we tried to look in the literature, there wasn't a lot in the literature, but it, uh, it certainly is there. Right. Yeah. What, so another question that came in is about um, he, your experience being a, a woman in this uh, largely male dominated field. And that was something that was interesting talking to you about as we collaborated on this project was, uh, you know, I kept kind of pushing, well, there must have been more incidents where the agents treated you like an outsider. And to a degree there, there was, they were a little more guarded around you. They tested you in certain ways uh, to make sure you could handle the gruesome nature of these crimes. Um, but it seemed like there there wasn't a whole lot of treating you differently. You, as soon as you came in and were part of the BSU, uh, your experience and your ability to uh, handle the crime scenes and the horrific nature of these events, just as well as the agent spoke for itself. And they seemed to quickly realize that you were uh, a, a very skilled addition to the team and that they could rely on you. Um, but can you speak about that a little bit? I know the book goes into it too, but sure. what we're experiencing. Yeah, I, I do think in general, people are, are outsiders who aren't who haven't been uh, educated and, and brought up in a certain discipline. For example, for the nursing, you know, I, I would not expect them to know much about that. And they felt like outsiders, I'm sure, in nursing. They were all investigators in law enforcement. And so, yes, um, I was an outsider and, and they did they did treat me somewhat differently. But as far as gender, gender was different. Gender wasn't, I never felt that it was gender. They knew I had something they needed and that was information and that was the victimology. And that because I had worked with the rape victims and I had much better knowledge base, if you will, in that particular area and they needed it. Um, I, I think that's why it made it, easier for them to to uh, work with me. The other thing is I was a nurse and the material did not bother me like uh, it might bother somebody that hadn't been in the health field because we did see terrible um, tragedy coming into the emergency room and things like that. So I do know that some of the persons that I would take down to the academy to lecture and so forth, they didn't like the crime scenes. And, and there are people that just don't like to look at them and they think that they're, uh, they're, they wouldn't be able to work in that type of setting. But um, outside of the testing, which I think they put everybody through a test, but that's the nature of uh, their investigators. They don't necessarily believe anything until they can prove it themselves. Uh, so outside of that, I, I think that uh, the gender issue was not a really a huge, a huge issue. But they, did, they started getting female agents in by the 80s. I know that Candace DeLong, whom I worked with on a case that's in the book on the uh, uh, Missy Ackerman case, she had come in. She was also a psychiatric nurse that then went into the FBI. So she, um, and she was one of the first. And they started having pro nurse um agents that wanted to work in the profiling started coming in by the mid 80s. So there are a few uh, questions in the Q&A that kind of uh, take that a step further um, and get at the idea of how did you handle, um, you know, dealing with this, this type of graphic work? Did it affect you? Uh, how did you get through it? Well, you really are taught in nursing, you have to compartmentalize. You can't go into a case and work with anybody, whatever the, the health problem is, if you you know have a bias against it or whatever, you, you, it's just not part of the ethics or whatever. So uh, from that standpoint, I, I don't think I had any, any necessary difficulty. It's the, uh, how do you handle it after the case is over when you're going home and things? And I know that the agents were very strict on not taking any case home. I don't think 
I'm pretty sure the wife did not know the kinds of cases they were working on because they, they wanted to keep it separate. So work was work, but when they were home, it was family and, and just normal kinds of, of, of things. So, uh, but for my part, in terms of, um, um, I always like music. So music, I always get the music on when I'm driving around or thinking of other things, not necessarily in any way thinking about, about the cases that I can help it. <laughs> right. Um, all right, let's uh, get back into the presentation part. Um, so the book uh, talks about a lot of lesser known serial killers uh, because a lot of the bigger ones have been gone over again and again, uh, but we did include a few that are um, a little more well-known and portrayed in popular culture. And one of them is BTK. Uh, and we included him from a media perspective and what the BSU learned from killers like BTK about how to interact with the media and how media could be a tool for capturing some of these serial killers. Can you speak a little bit about that and why that was important? Sure. And I think we, we do point out that the ego is really what brings them down is uh, and even his uh, the photo there of him in the, showing off and, and getting attention showed to him he's dressed in the victim's clothing of all things and and he's tying himself up that was one of his erotic aspects of of uh, his uh, pattern of behavior if you will so in the media that's where they try to catch them is once they start um and trying to engage the media by writing to them letters or whatever, that is where the agents realized, especially Douglas realized that this was a, a gold mine to try to, you have to engage with them and, and get them and see what you can learn from them and then see if that's going to be a way that you can, if you will, catch them. And uh, BTK, that's exactly what happened. He, they did a, what, a 10 year or 20 year, uh, analysis of his of the person's crime. It was they didn't have him at that time of the suspect, and he read it and he needed to correct them, and so he writes to them and says, you know, if I send you a disc, uh, will you be able to track me? And of course, the the detective says, oh no, we 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 can't find out who you are, and um, sends the disc, and of course they found out who he was, and his question to them at the end was, uh, why did why. Why did you arrest me? Or why did you do that? Why'd you lie to me? And they said, we want to catch you. And, you know, it was, it was such, and, and he was dumbfounded almost that they would, he thought that they really liked him. You know, his ego was such as everybody's got to like me if they went in. Here's this man who is um, murdering and, and torturing all these, uh, these women and family. He killed family members. He was, and he knew them. He knew who some of them were. Yeah, so I think that, yeah, so I just think the media uh, is, is important in this case. I found that really interesting, too, when you would talk about that. Um, you know, people, I think their initial thought about serial killers and certainly the initial uh, response you guys got from the FBI was, oh, these people are just, they're crazy. There's nothing to learn from them. You, you know, don't waste your time. Um, but there was a lot to learn from them. And, you know, one of the things that you learned from killers like BTK was how important their ego was to them, their sense of place, and they wanted to be recognized and appreciated for their crimes. They would compare themselves to other serial killers and adopt other practices like BTK did with adding a, uh, a symbol to his letters like Berkowitz had done. Um, he had taken things from uh, Harvey Glattman, who would take photos of his victims by binding them up and then savoring that moment afterwards. Um, so they did pay attention to the media. They did pay attention to how they were perceived, and they did try and correct the record. And you learned to use that as a tool to uh, not, not really to antagonize them because you didn't want them to commit more crimes, but to get into their heads a little bit and to learn what made them tick and what made them a unique individual. And then you could narrow down that suspect pool, pool to finding that right person. Oh, yes. I mean, that, uh, that was the whole purpose of it, uh, sending the agents in. And the agents, because they are FBI, it commanded a certain amount of respect and authority and got information from them that other disciplines couldn't get. Um, I certainly wouldn't, if, if I have since, not with this group, but I certainly have interviewed 
and and your your gender, your discipline, your your background does make a difference in what they're going to tell you. So I always felt that they got the very best information, especially about committing the crime and the the, the whole crime scene, if you will, uh, was so important in uh, to understand their their thinking. And that's what we wrote about is is uh, how how they what the, uh, how their minds work that they could kill over and over it was an obsession it was uh they couldn't stop i think that's the other thing is is that um they was they they could tell you they wouldn't stop until they got arrested and well not everyone don't forget ed kemper had there are two of them of the 36 that actually did have to uh turn themselves in that they weren't being caught and uh th th that was interesting i think kemper what I found interesting in looking at some of his material is that he hadn't been caught. He was he was already thinking about being a mass killer, of just going out, and it wasn't enough just to kill one or two. Yeah, it definitely escalated, and that's something that you found throughout your research too. And something else you found was that a lot of these killers, and you did just touch on that, uh, wanted to be authority figures, wanted to get into law enforcement, maybe wanted to be FBI agents, but just you know for whatever reason couldn't accomplish that. Uh, so they liked particularly to get the attention of the FBI and would speak to them on what they thought was a more level footing. Uh, and Raider has this one sort of interesting story in which he was uh, in charge of his community, uh, making sure they paid attention to the, the community rules. And if people's lawn was too long, he would go around with a measuring stick and give them a ticket for that. Um, so a, a question came in about these killers is, uh, can serial killers like Kemper or BTK be rehabilitated? What does it take for them to see the extent of their crimes? Well, the uh, ages were pretty clear on this since they had gone in and, and interviewed them and they, they felt there was no such thing on serial killers because it was so repetitive and so so ingrained in them that they could not be rehabilitated, that it was important that they be available to talk and to talk about the crimes, uh, and uh, but not not to be rehabilitated. Now they might take a different position if it was a younger person, or if they had only uh, if they didn't have a whole pattern and so forth. But certainly they did not feel that you could rehabilitate a serial killer. There's another question that comes in that's uh, asking about if there were any conflicts between the psychological approach of uh, profiling versus a more forensics or traditional approach. Um, but I think that that's a bit of a misconception because forensic was a big part of the profiling process as well. Uh, they weren't mutually exclusive. They did play into each other quite a bit, but I'll let you speak to that one a little more. Well, you, um, actually, we started out that they did not want for the project, for it to be a psychological study, in essence, they wanted it behavioral because they had to find the, they had to be able to tell the local police behavior, you know, and, and characteristics. Uh, I remember John Douglas saying to me, I, I can't go, and I can't go out there and find somebody who's got a complex over their mother. You know, I, I've got, you've got to help me understand a little what that all means. So we would have to look at, uh, obviously, if they're killing women, they certainly have, at the least, problems with uh, anger and rage towards women. You can't kill without having anger and rage. So there, there you are right there. Uh, but they wanted the behavior. They wanted to know how. Uh, they also wanted to know the cars. So they're very car oriented. I always laughed at that. They could, they would love to profile people, even guess that they would have down there what their car was like, and uh, and they caught some. No, um, no doubt about it. They caught uh, several serial rapists by their car, and so they would always ask when they were. They would always train agents to say you always find out if they had noticed any unusual cars in the area uh, prior to this to this uh, crime and uh, certainly I remember one where they had noticed a white uh, Mercedes and there was a, an unusual car to be in the particular area where they were and sure enough they went and, and uh, got a list of all the in that particular area and uh, got a list that wasn't that long a list and they found uh, they found one that they, uh, whenever they got a search warrant and went in, in the glove compartment was a whole list of all his victims. 
every single one of them. He had about 60 victims, rape, rape um, victims. So I would never, you know, I, I would always say, absolutely, we will find out what kind of car they drive. But uh, ma mainly it's the behavior because they didn't feel the psychology would help them find the suspect. It's one thing to find a suspect and investigate the crime, but then I'm sure afterwards to talk about what their um, psychologically, what went wrong was, was very helpful. And, we, and they did that in their interviews. So one of the other things the book does, so it follows you know, chronologically your time at the BSU and it gets up, it starts in the early seventies with nursing and it gets to late seventies when you join the BSU and a lot of the big cases you did throughout the eighties. And then as we get into the nineties, it transitions to your work um, on the legal side of serial cases. Uh, but one thing that stuck out to me too was how there was a, a the, the cultural element that the book touches on too is how there was this change where when you first joined the FBI, it was very much Hoover's FBI, in which there were the G-men who were sort of heroic figures, American icons, and serial killers, again, were just dismissed, crazy, there's nothing to them, don't waste your time. And as, as the book progresses, it, it starts to see a bit of a fascination with serial killers. They become American icons, and people are much more interested in their stories uh, than the, the stories of the FBI. Uh, and one of the things you wanted to do is being very aware of that. You never wanted to forget the victim throughout this book. You wanted to make sure the victim's voices and the victim's stories were always heard, even as the serial killer started to loom larger. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why that was so important to you? Well, first of all, the victim was the, in a, any type of murder. That's the only, um, that's the main behavior that they have is the victim so that they always started off with the victim and who she was, uh, where, what she did as much profiling the victim as possible, but in a, a, a way that would help them in the investigation. And so, because my work with, with rape victims and I felt it so important to get their story out because everybody had it wrong. I mean, the two themes that they said back when we started the rape study is, oh, well, they dress provocatively and they really want to be raped. I mean, these are insane statements. And I still hear some today of oh, the provocative victim, blah, blah, blah. Why is she wearing that particular outfit? Doesn't she know? Um, and they then always try to say that it's the victim that is instigating the, of the offender's behavior. But um, because I, I had the opportunity to talk to so many victims in our, our initial study and have still over the years done a lot of work with victims and, and evaluating them and testifying in court, that it is, um, I, that's just what I think is important. And many people don't even think about the victim, especially in a homicide. They get all interested in the offender. I think in the, in the book, we even say, I, I remember hearing down there, um, a conversation between two agents saying, well, who's your favorite serial killer? And I'm like, who's your favorite serial killer? And, but that's true. That is something that people can relate to. And they will think, you know, and sometimes I'm asked, uh, who's your favorite? I don't know if they use the word favorite, but uh, and, and you can answer it is, of course, they all have, I answered that they all have very different um, meanings in terms of what we've learned from them. I think of it in terms of who taught me what. Yeah. Um, so that, that, there's a few we didn't get to, but that's all right. That pretty much brings us to the end. There's one uh, last question in the chat here, uh, which asks uh, if somebody doesn't want to draw the attention of the FBI, what, uh, what car should they avoid? Okay, I, I okay. I need that interpretive. If if yeah, they were just making a joke about you know what's the type of car that a serial rapist or serial oh car. Okay, I missed yeah. that car. Oh well, no, it's it's uh, the car has everything to do with how authority and and how either they, they will tell you whether it's messy inside, it was that organized or disorganized, what color it is, what type it is. Um, <laughs> so they. Um, that's just their, their little inside information that they, they have done probably, well, they probably have looked at more cars than, than any of us would ever in, in our fields would ever have been interested in. 
but uh, I know that on the <laughs> on the advisory board they had us they, they they were trying to tell all of us what kind of a car we drove. I, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Well, they learned to use every bit of information available. There you go. <laughs> that was such a wonderful conversation. Thank you both so so much for sharing it with us tonight, and uh, thank you everyone out there for uh, spending your evening with us. Um, you can learn more about this fascinating book and purchase it on our website, harvard.com or via the link in the chat, I should put it in again. Um, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a wonderful night, keep reading and um, please be well. And, and thank you both so much for this conversation. It was great. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for attending. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night.